Dear church family, we are so delighted that you are here with us. Happy Sabbath. If you can see uh, to my right here, I have Pastor Nenik with us. Thank you so much. He's going to be sharing God's word with us. For those of you that are, that are at home, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please feel free to share comments as you hear the message. Uh, now, before we begin, and we bring our music team over to lead us to God in prayer, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. I want to let you guys know that we do have a virtual presence. We have a Facebook group called Brown Chapel, and we put details on all the announcements in there. And I also want to let you know that uh, our church board has asked that as one of the guidelines for meeting inside the sanctuary that we have face coverings on. So if you don't have one, we do have masks out in the foyer and you can put those on. So uh, I'm gonna ask everyone that is able to put a, a face mask on, uh, mask on to do that at this moment. It's one of the guidelines to have in-person services. And I understand that some people have a hard time breathing if that's the case, we encourage you to put a shield on. Put a shield on. Uh, moving forward, moving forward, we are going to be asking people to please uh, not come inside the building at this time if they're unable to meet the guidelines. So I, I ask you to please work with us. We want to be able to keep our church open, and that is one of the guidelines that we have to follow to be able to do that. Thank you so much for understanding, and at this time, I'm going to ask our praise team to come over and take us to the throne of grace through music. God bless you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Brownsburg Church. We're going to sing hymn number 470, There is Sunshine in My Soul Today, and ask that you please stand and join us. Oh, 
thank you. You may be seated, and we'll sing our next song, which is Showers of Blessing. The weather's unpredictable. We figured we'd cover the bases both ways. <laughs> Debbie has our children's story. So. If we can, sp I'm not sure we can spread out enough. Let's maybe stay in our seats because there's a lot of people here today. But, see that dog up there? That is my grand dog. That is, um, his name is, well, let me see. His name is officially Wesley. Now, hit the next slide. The first time that my daughter, Julie, and her husband, Ted, uh, found out about Wesley, he was that little picture there on the left, that little one. He was about eight weeks old. And a family member, I don't remember which one, um, got to know him, uh, owned him, and was trying to get rid of the puppies. And they really liked him, but they went back and forth. We have three cats. We're a cat family. We don't want a dog. That was Ted. Julie's like, I want a dog. I've, I wanted a dog all my life. I, I miss my dog. I want a new dog. So eventually, he came home. And now he looks a lot bigger. He looks like that. That's him sitting in his bed in the other picture. Um, but then there was a question of what to name him. And there's, there was a long discussion. They had, we had a Facebook Messenger conversation going on between Ted and Julie and myself and my husband, Chris. And we're all talking about what are we going to name the dog. And they were arguing, not nice arguing, but they came up with all kinds of names. And in the meantime, they just called him Doggo. So, um, Go ahead and flip the next picture. Um, 
These are two more pictures of him. Um, he had to have surgery. He had to wear the cone of shame for a while. Um, but he also, at one point, he loves to get wrapped up in a blanket and sit there. Um, there's lots of cool pictures. But it took a long time to get his name. In the meantime, they just called him Doggo. Um, so now they finally settled on the official name is Wesley. It's from Princess Bride. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie. Um, but it is one of my favorites, one of my daughter's favorites. And um, my par personal name, we kind of all picked our favorite name. My personal favorite name for the dog was Dread Pirate Doggo. But um, if you're familiar with Princess Bride, I got a couple giggles. If you're familiar with Princess Bride, you know why I said that. Um, but they named him Wesley. But, and it, that's what's on his official papers. But they still just call him Doggo. Um, now, what's my point? We all have different names. And our names are ours, but they're also other people's. Mark, down there, you are the third Mark in your family, aren't you? Your daddy is Mark. Your grandpa is Mark. Um, my name is Debbie. There's nobody else in my family by, oh, nope, my cousin. Um, actually, funny story about that. Mom wanted to name me De Deborah Lynn, but I had a cousin, and she was sure my cousin was Deborah Lynn, so she named me Deborah Ann. My cousin is also Deborah Ann. <laughs> we both changed our names to Debbie. I dropped the E. She dropped the E and a B, so we're slightly different, but... Um, the point is, we share names, but God has a name for each one of us. Doggo right there has his name that means to him is Doggo. That's what he answers to. Well, God has a name for each one of us. And he said in the Bible that when we get to heaven, He's going to give us a new name, and it's going to be special. And nobody else has that name. But you know what? You already have that name. He's just going to tell us. God knows each and every one of you individually. He knows who you are, and he calls you by name. And when he talks about you, and he does, he talks about, I love those kids so much. I saw what Ella is doing. And, man, I really love that girl. I watched Jack today do go, go well in school. I love that little boy. And I don't know all your names, but God does. And he loves each and every one of you. And you matter to God. And you are special, one of a kind, just to him. Just like Doggo is very special to my daughter's family. Thank you. Scripture reading today comes from 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. Then Naaman went with his horse and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning, friends. Happy Sabbath. It is great to be with you, as always, here in Brownsburg, one of my favorite churches to, to visit, and, and it's always good to see familiar faces. It's good to see a few more people here um, as we begin to transition 
um, slowly, ever so slowly for all of our sakes to maybe a post-COVID world, if, the, if there ever will be um, such a thing. Um, they were singing songs. My mind was just kind of drifting, thinking about um, the last year. It was about a, almost exactly a year ago, wasn't it, when um, all this really kind of hit. Um, I specifically remember spring break because my daughter was planning on going on a mission trip um, to South America. Um, I forget the country right off. Had her tickets bought and everything was packed and they were supposed to get on the bus, I think, at, at 8 or 9 o'clock that night um, as spring break started at Indiana Academy. And a, just a few hours before is when um, the country down there closed and literally hours away from getting on a plane shut down. And I remember just that whole rash of, of everything being canceled from sports to the world as we know. Almost exactly a year ago. And time has inched along, at least for me, over the last year, it seems, um, through all this. But... Um, it, it's good to be together um, as we still try to be safe with face masks, and we probably will for, for a while and, and different things. But it, it's good to bump elbows and bump fists a, a little bit and, and just have some sense of, of fellowship as we worship our God together. I know, Bruce, you had mentioned earlier you struggled. I really struggled with, with the exclusive online thing as well. Uh, my wife kind of engaged it. Um, she's watching online today, actually. Um, I said I wouldn't mention you. I guess I, I lied. I didn't mean to lie, but <laughs> um, that's why she didn't want to come. She's afraid that I would embarrass her. Um, I guess I can do it online as well. But anyway, it's good to be with you. I'm Terry Nenick. For those who, who don't know, I live up in the Anderson area. Um, I worked for the church um, as a pastor and in uh, academy work for about 20 years. And um, in Indiana and in Minnesota, which is where I'm originally from, and um, about three years ago moved back to uh, Indiana from Minnesota, and I'm working up um, in the Anderson area um, at a wholesale nursery landscape company, and so we got really busy a couple weeks ago, and this week I spent all week still doing some office stuff, but planting trees. We planted several thousand trees already out in the field, uh, growing those, and so I noticed I'm already getting a suntan. <laughs> spring and as the grass begins to green up um, we look forward to um, being outside and all the good things that spring hold well let's pause and and bow our heads as we prepare to open god's word most gracious heavenly father lord thank you for um a seventh day of the week to slow down from uh, busy lives um and specifically focus on, on you. Um, we remember you every day, but as we worship you, our hearts are open to receive the blessing your Holy Spirit has in store. I pray that you guide my thoughts as we worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you here um, probably are familiar with the story of Ernie Davis. Ernie Davis succeeded um, at so much in his life, especially early on. He was a phenomenal athlete. All-American football player at Syracuse University. He led his high school team to 52 straight victories in basketball. And when he went to college as a standout running back, he led Syracuse to their only national championship in the early 1960s, late 50s, early 60s. As a senior in 1961, he won the Heisman Trophy as the first African-American to do so. His dream was to play in the NFL, and he was drafted number one overall and signed the largest contract ever for a professional athlete at that time. Truly, the sky was the limit for this young man with so much potential. From every account, he was a stand-up young man and a good human being. But before he could play his first National Football League game, 
his life changed forever because he was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, on an NFL field, despite so much potential in his life and so much anticipation and so much expectation. If you have your Bible, chapter 5 in the Old Testament, 2 Kings, chapter 5, we see a Another individual, thousands of years before in biblical history, and we get his story quickly in verse 1. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1. God's word says, Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king, great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Just kind of like Ernie Davis, all these good things going for him, but... Leukemia. Here we see all these things for this great military general, military leader, confident to the king of his country. So much going for him, a valiant man, a decent man, all this wonderful things, but a big but. He came down with a fatal disease, leprosy. There was certainly no cure for leprosy back when this was written, and it was a, a death sentence. So despite all these wonderful things going on in his life, all the, the victories he led, all the respect, all the influence he had to his family, to his country, his life took a downward spiral with seeming no end. But he was a leper. Verse 2 says, Now the Arminians had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife, his, um, Naaman's wife's servant, if you will. And she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria. Then he would cure him of leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten changes of clothes, and brought the letter to the king of Israel. We'll stop there momentarily. Just to unpack a little bit what we're reading about here. Naaman, that this mighty man of an enemy to the children of Israel, a, a, a great person still, who God, no doubt, was, was working in his life, comes down with this fatal disease. Seeming to have no hope, there was no cure, as I mentioned. It was an unheard of thing. But we have a little Israelite girl who we know nothing about. We don't know her name. Though God certainly did. Who, in her young life, being raised by her um, God-fearing parents in Israel, at some point is going through the events of her day, Nahum comes and attacks her village, and she's taken captive as a slave, as a young girl. We don't know how old. Eight, nine, ten, maybe. It's conjecture, but... but quite young, and her life is turned upside down. We, we know nothing else about her other than the little bit we've read that um, she's a young Israelite girl who was taken captive. We're going to assume that she doesn't see her parents again. That from this age, everything she knew and loved and trusted, her safety net is gone, and now she's a slave in a foreign land to the general's wife's. A slave to the general's wife is servant. And yet, God is with her. 
in a wonderful way. And what's amazing is despite all the things that we don't know, we do know that her parents had a wonderful (laughs) success in training her as a young child. Because even though she's taken as a prisoner and becomes a slave to a a pagan (laughs) enemy, one the events unfold and her master's husband comes down with answer and she begins to share no doubt with God's leading that there might be a possibility of something that can be done if only you could get to the prophet in Israel Elisha It's an interesting thing to put yourself in the different places of of the different individuals in this story. There's so many different layers and levels you can just kind of appreciate. You have Naaman, um, a, a general for the enemy of the children of Israel, who has got this fatal disease, seeming to be hopeless. At that time, it was certainly a death sentence. He has to separate himself, by and large, from his family, from everything, and his life, for all practical purposes, is over as he knows it. You have this little girl, again, a slave in a foreign land, who um, is working hard and no doubt gains the respect of the people, but when the message comes to Naaman, th- there's possibly a solution, but in order to have the solution, you have to go to the prophet of your enemy in a foreign land to get that. Try just unpacking that in your own mind, all the thoughts, the emotions that would go with, with such a, a scenario. Yes, there's hope, but to get to this hope, I have to go to my enemy carefully, those who I've attacked and and even taken captive, including this little girl, and ask for them to heal me. Man, it's emotional even thinking about being in type of a scenario. So complex. Naaman... in his situation, sees this as maybe the only possible lifeline to an extended life. And so somehow, over a relatively short period of time, no doubt, he works through this scenario where he goes to his king and says, I've heard of a possibility where I might not be dying an early death, where I could be of service to you, my king, but... Hear me out, we have to go to our enemy and to their prophet, and maybe he can heal me. Well, the king obviously thinks enough about Naaman. Again, it shows to his character, his integrity. The Bible said there in verse 1 that Naaman was a great man, and so he's given permission by his king to go to the king of Israel to explore this possible avenue of healing. So he's sent well-equipped. He's given a lot of of wealth to take. One estimate uh, I read said it's a million dollars you know, who knows what, but, but there's lots of gold, there's lots of silver, there's very fine clothes that he, he's given to go. And no doubt, even in Naaman's caution as he works through this, there begins to, to build a little bit of excitement, of expectation of being healed. And as he had heard stories, no doubt there was further doubt about the God of Israel and prophet Elisha and what might happen. And Naaman very likely begins to build a scenario in his mind because of his reputation, even going to the enemy land. And what might be that that as he, he comes humbly, kind of waving a white flag, if you will, I'm not coming in war, I'm not coming, I'm coming in peace would have preceded him even um, 
what was going on, that he was a leper, that's something you don't hide, because even if he's coming in his chariot, everyone's going to be keeping distance of, of more than six feet, <laughs> if you will, away from Naaman. Talk about, you know, social distancing. If someone's got leprosy, you know, they were banished, if you will, because this was highly, highly contagious disease. So maybe we can say Naaman has a severe case of COVID, <laughs> as he's coming seeking healing. But a fatal case. Everyone spread out. They come to the king of Israel with his parade, pomp and circumstance, with an expectation building in his mind of seeing this God they've heard about work and leading to possible healing, and they show up to the king of Israel. And present the request. There wasn't as much excitement as he probably anticipated. He probably anticipated that this great meeting with the king was humbled by him showing up. That the prophet is summoned from the side of the stage to, to come on and he'll wave his hands and have this massive prayer and this will just be an awesome event. Everybody there will be awed as Naaman is honored and as he is healed and, and it'll be one of those things that everybody will talk about for generations to come. The one to get the t-shirt that says, I was there when Naaman was healed. What an event this expected to be in Naaman's mind. Then we get to reality of what happens according to the Bible. Verse 6, if you still want to follow along, in 2 Kings chapter 5, and he, Naaman, brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now, as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And it came about when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make a lie that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. Rather than all this pomp and circumstance and this great healing, the king is in distress. He, he, he's piecing together that, that maybe this is some type of event to attack them. He's, he's not coming in peace, but there's some subtlety going on here. And the king is obviously... Um, fearful, afraid, just hearing this, that, that this man wants to be cured of his leprosy, the king knows that he doesn't have that ability. It's almost an unheard of thing. And so you can see the tensions just shoot through the roof if you're in this situation looking on. Silence settles things for a moment as both sides take a deep breath. Verse 8 says, And it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel, there's hope as the tensions escalate, de-escalate a little bit. Elisha enters the scene, the man that Naaman was told about. So Naaman comes with his horses and his chariots in verse 9, comes to the house of Elisha. He's finally getting to the right place. Maybe there is hope after all. Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha had heard what had going on, that he had leprosy. No doubt as a prophet, God had communicated with Elisha as well about this situation. Naaman still has all these expectations of the prophet of God coming out and, and this great healing service that will happen in restored life. But does Elisha show up here? 
Actually, he doesn't. Elisha sent a messenger to Nahum, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. That seems fairly simple. On the surface, on the other hand, to name it, it's insulting. On multiple levels, again, try to put yourself into the situation in, in, in different, understand a little bit. So, so Naaman is at the prophet's house expecting to meet this great man that he's heard about. Naaman himself is a man of authority, a valiant man, so he expects to meet his equal, if not superior, counterpart. But instead, Elisha sends the servant. Think about the servant in this unique situation with a general outside the door of the enemy with leprosy. And Elisha says, hey, just go tell him to dip in the Jordan seven times and he'll be healed. What, Elisha? You want me to do what? You want me to go get within six feet of him? Maybe I can try to keep the, the, the distance a little bit more. And you want me to simply go tell him to dip in the river. That's what God told you, Elisha. Okay. Naaman hears this message, and what's his reaction? What would your reaction be? The Bible tells us what Naaman's reaction was in verse 11. And Naaman was extremely enthusiastic and excited. It's not what my Bible says, if you're following along. It says, and Naaman was what? Angry, furious is the word that my Bible says. Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me. Stand and call the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over this place and cure my leprosy. Naaman, I, I've alluded to this, but, but the Bible clearly says Naaman had these expectations of how this was going to go down, if it was going to go down at all, for him to be healed in this way with his expectations, his expectations, not God's expectations. A quick aside, which we'll unpack over the next couple minutes about expectations. I know so many times in my life, my expectations have gotten me in trouble. Even when I thought I was following God, expectations can be a, a fickle thing, if you will. What we expect, because we live in this world, which is a sinful world, a fallen world, and we're very influenced, unfortunately, by negative things of this world who can greatly influence our expectations of life, of circumstances, including our expectations of God and how we think God should work what we think God is like, partly from our own experiences, but partly from what others say and do and, and our observations. Naaman's expectations were, were clearly not in line with God's working in this situation. He's furious he says, I thought he would come and, and wave his hands and call on his God as a man of authority, not send a messenger. Man, that's insulting. If they want war, we're going to give them war. I can just see Naaman in his mind. I will show them. No one does this to me and makes a fool of me. Very quickly, we see a, a complicating factor in here of Naaman's pride as my pride 
many times has gotten me in trouble. Maybe you too. Are not, Naaman says in verse 12, the Abana and the Farpa rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away in a rage. Again, he's like, not only am I insulted, this is stupid. <laughs> we got really good rivers back in Damascus. Beautiful rivers, clear, crystal clear water, beautiful groves, just picture perfect river. And you want me to go wash in the muddy, dirty Jordan River. Your puny river compared to my beautiful rivers on top of it. Now you're insulting me. You're insulting where I come from, and, and you just don't even get it. I've been to the Jordan River in, in Israel. Um, it's not a particularly beautiful <laughs> river. It tends to be muddy. You've heard the muddy Jordan. Back in biblical times, it's, it's a brown river thousands of years later. You know, I mean, obviously it has significance. We know Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. The children of Israel crossed the Jordan into the promised land. There's lots of biblical ties in with the Jordan River. But again, it, it's not this picture-perfect thing. And Naaman alludes to that here. So no doubt he packs everyone up and starts heading out. And again, the tensions are just at an extreme high there with his anger we now have a, a a man of authority who's enraged and furious and they start going and they're a, a mile or two or three or or five down the road and finally one of naaman's servants who's just kind of looking on gets up enough courage to go to naaman fearful that he's going to have his head knocked off because of naaman's fury and in verse 13, then his servant came near and spoke to him and said, my father. No doubt just, uh, you, you can hear just trying to de-escalate the situation. Naaman, sir, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? If he had told you to go conquer the entire West and, and lead a charge against armies ten times the size, you would have done it without question. If he told you to climb the highest mountain barefoot, you would not have hesitated, but you would have done it. There's very little he could have asked you to do which would have challenged you that you wouldn't have it embraced and said, sure, there's my answer, I'm going to go and do it. But he asked you a simple thing maybe maybe you should just do it what harm could there be in going dipping seven times and seeing what happens so obviously he gets through to Naaman Naaman's calmed down and says, okay, point the chariots and all the men to the Jordan River. Got nothing to lose. I guess you're right. Himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I don't know if you were raised in church, but when I was a kid, I went to, to Sabbath school. And you, this is a, a great Sabbath school story, you know. Um, I think there's even a song or something about it, about coming down once, twice, three, four, five, you know, coming up each time looking and nothing's changed. And going down that seventh time and coming up out of the water being clean. Again, the ebb and flow of, of this story is so powerful when you dig a little deeper into it. 
Naaman is, is, is healed. The, the, the joy, <laughs> the enthusiasm that he would have, his lo- it, it, the miracle that's happened to him is, is almost indescribable. All those looking on, his servants and stuff, I, I can't imagine, you know, them <laughs> looking on, you know, their doubts about this is the craziest thing I've ever heard, but, but why not? And when Naaman comes up from having the, the white hue of death to him to his skin being like that of a little child, as the Bible says, would take anyone's breath away at that moment. Wow. Verse 15. When he returned to the man of God, Naaman, with his company, came and stood before him. He said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So take a present now from your servant. Again, he, he, he's got tremendous wealth he, he, he's brought, gold and, and, and silver, say a million dollars, let's say a hundred million dollars, I, I don't know, but there was not much that his king wasn't willing to do to, to, to pour out on the chance that Naaman w- would be healed. So he comes to Elisha and says, I, I brought all this for you, all this gold, all And, of course, Elisha says, nope, (laughs) I don't want any of that. It's not about the wealth. God did it. I didn't do it. Take your stuff and go. And, obviously, Naaman says in verse 17, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings, or will he sacrifice to other gods, but only to the Lord. Lord, pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there and he leans on my arm and I have to bow down with him, I will bow down in the house of the pagan god, Rimon. May the Lord pardon his servant in this matter. So he said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him some distance. Despite all this up and and down, Naaman is healed. He comes to acknowledge the God of Israel as the one only true God. His wealth is is rejected. Elisha, of course, had said there that it's not mine, (laughs) not worth it. It, God is the one who, who did this. Story doesn't quite end there. There's a whole other section, which could be another sermon, just if you're not familiar with the story or if you don't remember, Naaman heads out and this servant of Elisha, who's the one to give the message, is looking on, kind of paying uh, attention. He's like, man, that was a lot of money that Elisha just passed up. I could use a little bit of that. And so Elisha's servant takes off and catches Naaman without Elisha knowing and, and says, um, so some other people showed up who could really use that money, so if I could have a little bit of it, that would be appreciated. And so Naaman is more than happy to give um, Elisha's servant, Gehazi is his name, a little bit of it gives him a little bit of silver and a couple changes of clothes. Gehazi turns and, and goes back, and Elisha says, Gehazi, where have you been? The author of the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, suggests that Elisha was shown by God what Gehazi was doing, even the conversations that he had with Naaman after this. And Gehazi says, Nothing, Elisha, I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> And Gehazi is given the leprosy that Naaman was cured of and has it the rest of his life. But we digress a little bit. Interesting, again, the flow 
of that. But as our time winds down, there's a couple thoughts that I want to draw from this wonderful, challenging, great, horrible (laughs) story that God has. One of them is on the concept of being obedient. Different obedience and disobedience is going on in this story if you stop and look. One, we have the obedience of the little servant girl who's standing up for what she believes in her God, even though her life has been turned upside down. We have the initial disobedience of Naaman who's told to go and wash in the Jordan River, who, who is furious w- w- with this and, and turns and goes away until his servant talks a little bit of sense into him. And then he follows in simple obedience and sees his life miraculously healed. And then we have the disobedience and blatantly lies and receives a horrific judgment as a result. Obedience is important. That probably can't be. Obedience is critical when it comes to following God. Our expectation, which we'll talk about in a second, needs to be being Obedient and faithful to God, even if it's not the most popular thing, which in this world, the reality, it won't be. Naaman had to intentionally put aside his pride through this story about going to the enemy being told to do something which was crazy in his mind, even insulting to him, ultimately to receive the true healing and, I don't know if reward's the right word, but concepts to reflect on of obedience, concepts to reflect on of the danger of pride. Pride goes before the fall. Quite simple. I've certainly experienced that in in my life. Pride was the initial sin, I believe, when Lucifer, the highest created being, wants the power of God himself. In the Garden of Eden, Eve wants to be like God, knowing good from evil. Pride in Adam, and it just, this sin has spiraled down through the history of sin from whatever time period, thousands and whatever years ago when sin first reared its ugly head in the universe. I want to conclude by thinking for a moment on expectations again, which we've alluded to. Often the false expectations that we have when it comes to things in life and even things about God, how God will work in my life and in the way that I think he will work. We all naturally have ideas and and as we think and even as we pray and process things out. Well, what others tell us. And so we get our expectations, and as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, this plays into our expectations of the end times, no doubt. It is wrong. I don't, don't start going. I'm not going down that road. But, you know, we have expectations of Scenarios we look for that when these things happen, we'll know that the end is close. And, and, and this is the thing to look for. 
For those who have been in the, in the Adventist church a long time, the Sunday law, when the Sunday law comes, if you're newer to Adventist, that might not make sense to you. That's okay. Talk to somebody else about that. They'll, they'll fill you in. <laughs> But, but well, when this comes, then you'll know the time is near, and then you'll know to get ready. But until then, just do a good job. <laughs> Does that make sense to, to, to some of you? What expectations do we have of God working in our lives today? How do those expectations truly line up with what God is, is doing? What expectations do we have of ourselves, what we will do if we want to be perfectly following God's will, believing that this world, the time in this world is running out? You know, a, a year ago, none of us would have imagined a year and three months ago, <laughs> none of us could have imagined what the last year would hold. Maybe the next year will be calm <laughs> and peaceful. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe not. Maybe the next year will make 2020 look like a cakewalk. But I do believe that this time, <laughs> the time in this world is running out. As Seventh day Adventist Christians, for decades and decades, 150 plus years, we've been saying that Jesus is coming soon. We're living in the end of the world's history and we need to do everything for ourselves being right with God and as we can in a biblical, faithful way because the time is short. May we be faithful to God to have true, accurate expectations of what God is doing in our life, the life, the choices that we're making today that affect our circle of influence for God. Let's conclude, if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 64. We'll get there in the next couple weeks in the Sabbath school lesson as we finish Isaiah. Isaiah 64. Starting at verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on thy name, who arouses himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hidden thy face from us and hast delivered us into the power of our iniquity. But now, O Lord, thou art our... You are the potter. All of us are the work of thy hands. There's that song, you are the potter, I am the clay. God, as the potter, we are the clay. What are the ex what's the expectation of the clay <laughs> in the hands of the potter? The expectation is that the potter will make a masterpiece with you when he does the work and we submit to him. So ultimately, my prayer for myself and my challenge to you is to fully submit to God, give all our expectations to him so that he can mold us into what he wants us to be. Let's pray. Gracious Father God, thank you for this story. Thank you for working in a mighty way back hundreds of years before Jesus came as a baby to this earth. Back through a little servant girl whose parents had <laughs> instilled all they could in her until she was taken away as a, a prisoner and a captive. 
but yet what was still in her was the heart of this story, pointing Naaman's wife and Naaman to ultimately the person who could reveal the true God to them, despite the false expectations that Naaman had. Lord, thank you for working in us so many years later. Forgive us for the false expectations that we have and the times when we are disappointed because of those false expectations. Lord, may we give our expectations to you. May you continue to mold us and form us as the potter does the clay. May we be open. May our pride be put in, in check when we are, are, are challenged to think, no, Lord, not this, not that, because I don't like that. Lord, forgive us for our false expectations. Forgive us for our pride. Thank you for offering us forgiveness as only found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, I took a shortcut. <laughs> Please stand as we sing our closing hymn. All the way. For the benediction, reading from Romans 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in grace. Amen.